Uh, yes, good morning everyone. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, I come to this conference from the internet. Uh, my first slide is a, a picture of the internet uh, that was taken a few years ago that visualizes all the connections of the people that are using the, the internet. And I was very uh, glad to see in Mohammed's presentation that one of those little dots is probably a floating school in, in Bangladesh somewhere where someone is sitting on a computer, um, which I think is, is, is great. Um, so I am um, speaking a little bit about these guys. Uh, they're called MOOCs or MOOC providers. MOOCs are massive open online courses, and I'm, I'm sure most of you uh, know this, and there's a special session about MOOCs right after this. Um, and uh, as I thought about speaking about MOOCs, I kind of kept running into uh, these bigger questions about why did we all get involved in, in learning and education and, and it's so easy to get hung up these days on, on a new technology, on more efficiency, on, on business models and on quality, on incremental improvements that I feel like sometimes we forget the reasons why many of us, uh, and I'm making some assumptions, but many of us got involved in, the, in this space in the first place, which I think has more to do with adventure and, and magic and the, the kind of the excitement and the uh, light that goes on when someone learns something new. So I thought what we could try to do uh, in the next uh, 25 minutes is uh, maybe remember some of that fascination and, and also see how that might guide us, give us an, another um, way forward to Im imagine what the university could do uh, in the future. Um, and so before, before I, I explain what you see on this extremely complicated slide, I want everyone to get up. Stand up. Oh, that was easy. I expected that to be much, much harder. Okay, now let's, everyone turn around. We'll turn around. We'll do a circle. Do a circle. Okay. And now we can sit down again. Um, so that, so that was great. Thank you for doing that with me. Um, my friend Eva, who I, I spoke to yesterday, she usually makes people put a pen in their mouth <laughs> and stand up. Um, and so I thought I'd, I would try this with something easier. But the reason why I wanted you to stand up is because of this slide. So some researchers at the Media Lab developed these devices that you can wear around your wrist. They measure electrodermal activity, which is um, essentially a, a proxy for your level of activity and engagement, and you can draw conclusions on all kinds of uh, aspects of your life. And what they've done is they've mapped out, they've, they've made students wear these, and they've mapped out when were they most engaged throughout the week, and then they asked them to track what they're doing. And the crazy thing in this slide is that the areas, um, and you probably can't see this in the back, but the areas where the students are the least engaged are the periods when they're sitting in class. So even when they're sleeping, when they're watching TV, <laughs> when they're doing chores, it doesn't matter what else, it's, you're more engaged than when you're sitting in class. And this is at MIT, right? So you know, people have this idea that at MIT, education is amazing and all the classes are riveting and everyone learns so much. And it's, uh, it's simply not true. And so I thought maybe um, a, a good starting point to think about education. I, I have two slides that I, I always come back to um, that I think, ha, I don't know, they, they just bring a lot of the values that I uh, find in learning and education and, and kind of visualize them in an interesting way. And so this is the first one. This is probably my favorite. Um, it's about uh, learning to ride a bicycle. So personal stories, I actually taught my sister to ride a bicycle. And it was an amazing experience for both of us. Uh, for her, because she learned to ride a bicycle and she fell off a few times. And for me, because it was the first time that I helped someone else learn something, and that's such an amazing, uh, powerful experience that you can actually take an interest in someone else's life and help them learn something new, and then you see kind of the effect of your work. And I think many of you must have experienced that in your careers. And, and so uh, for me, that was one of those important moments like very early on. And, but what is it about learning to ride a bike um, that, uh, that is interesting? So there, I think there are three... Um, Three points. One is you can never unlearn to ride a bike. Right? So when you learn to ride a bike, 
you can't imagine what life was like before you knew how to ride a bike. And even if you haven't ridden a bike for many, many years, you know, you can pick up a, um, what are they called, bicing uh, outside. You can get on it, you're gonna be a little bit wobbly, but you can probably still remember, you can still do it. So you can never unlearn it. And I think great learning is, uh, happens when the things you're learning are those important things that you can never unlearn. You can never imagine what the world was like before, before you learned it. Then secondly, it's an extremely powerful thing to know how to ride a bike, especially if you're, if you're this old, because now you can go to places that you couldn't go to before. Like you always needed your parents to take you somewhere, but if you learn to ride a bike, you can now go around the neighborhood, you can go visit your friends. So it, the, the learning is for something that will greatly expand your, your world. You can go to lots of, you, you have lots of new opportunities, and I think that's what great learning is about. Lots of new things that you can do with the, the thing you just learned. And then the, maybe the most important thing about the, the, the picture is it's, it's, uh, it's safe to fail. So, of course this little boy has fallen off the bike many times, but he's got a helmet, he's riding on the, on the lawn, he's not that high, he can fall off a few times and he's, not gonna, he's gonna be okay. My sister fell off a few times, she's okay today. Um, and so failure is safe, and I think that is one of the most important things in good learning, that people can fail and fail and fall off the bike, and we don't even call it failure. Failure is such a terrible word. And, and often when we talk edu about education today, we talk about assessment and certification, and in a way that is the worst thing to talk about because it makes everything about failure. You can really only fail when you start talking about assessment and, and certification. And it takes all the fun out of learning and, and I feel like we should remember the, the joy in, in learning and the safety of failure. And this is my second slide about learning that I feel has a lot kind of, there's some interesting ideas in here. And it's about mountain climbing. Uh, I'm not a mountain climber, so I'm, I, uh, if, if you're a mountain climber and I'm saying things that are completely wrong, please correct me afterwards. But, um, the picture shows that when you're climbing a mountain, lots of people have climbed it before you, ideally, or, well, in most cases, and they have marked the path that they've taken up the mountain, and so you're following these people who have come before you. I think that's what learning in most cases is about, right? You're following other people, you're standing on the shoulder of giants, and they have put their names on these little, like, you know, where they discovered a better way of, of doing it. So you have guides that you can follow, but the better you get, the more encouraged you are to find your own path, right? So there's nowhere that it says you can only go up this path. Everywhere on the mountain, you could decide to go a different way, you can go left, right, and the better you get, the more likely you are to find a better path. And then you can put your name on, on that path. And I feel like that's kind of a, a nice metaphor for, for learning as well, where you're following other people, but you're encouraged to find your own path not just follow the path that someone else has created. And of course, the most amazing thing about the mountain is when you get to the top, you, can, you have this incredible view and you can see lots of other mountains you, you, you might wanna climb up on. So I am very fortunate to be at a place uh, where learning has some of those uh, components. Um, uh, it's, it's called the MIT Media Lab. It's an institute uh, of MIT um, situated in Cambridge in the United States. It's fairly small. Uh, it's about 200 people, 140 students, uh, uh, 25 research groups roughly. Um, sometimes they add one, sometimes one goes away. Um, and uh, some faculty, some researchers, and yeah, and, and about 140 40 students. So it's fairly small. Uh, it was founded in the, in the 80s by Nicholas Negroponte. Uh, it's a very unusual uh, um, setup. It's part of a university, but it's almost entirely industry funded. And I can, um, I'm happy to talk about it more, but um, in, in, in this presentation, I probably can't go into too much detail. But what's special about the Media Lab for this presentation is um, there is a very deep philosophy of learning that is practiced there every day um, that we refer to as creative learning. Uh, it has a lot to do with studio-based learning, but it's really focused around three pillars, and that's passion, people, and projects. So the students at the Media Lab are encouraged to find something that they are passionate about. And if it doesn't fit in to the curriculum or the disciplines, even better. Uh, uh, um, Joey Ito, uh, the director of the Media Lab, who by the way doesn't have a, or didn't, there was a, um, a slide with all the people who dropped out of university. So Joey Ito, the director of the Media Lab, 
uh, did, never completed a, a university degree. He recently was awarded an honorary doctorate from the New School in New York, and we were all very disappointed that he accepted it. Um, so uh, it's passion, people, and projects. It's what, like, find something you're passionate about that really interests you, work with other people, some people who are your mentors and your professors who have more experience, but a lot of work happens between the students where they build something and they share it with the others, they critique each other, and then work on projects. So learning at the Media Lab happens in projects. No, if you don't build it, it doesn't, we don't consider it a, a, a useful um, uh, um, use of your time. You have to build something, you throw it away, you build the next thing. And at the end, you have this portfolio of work that you've created, and that work can be digital or physical, but there is something there that you can show to other people that demonstrates who you are um, much better than a number or a GPA or any kind of score that we could give you. Um, and the Media Lab uh, evaluates all of its projects using three indicators, and those three indicators are impact, uniqueness, and magic. And this is official Media Lab. Uh, this is not just something that we do uh, for fun, but this is an official Media Lab uh, practice. Uh, you can evaluate your projects using these three indicators, and I think it's very fitting for learning because impact and uniqueness are very important, and those are the things we often look at, right? We want to be unique. We want to come up with a new innovative uh, model. We want to have impact. We want to reach lots of people, or we want to make their lives much better. But we almost never talk about magic, and magic is all the stuff that we know when it's there, and we care about it, makes us smile, but maybe it's very difficult to measure. And so usually we ignore it because it's so hard to measure. But the reality is when you see magic on stage or you see magic in learning, you know it's there. And so the, the Media Lab kind of um, acknowledges that. And the other place that I've been fortunate to be involved with is the Peer-to-Peer -peer University, which is an organization that I co-founded with lots of other people um, and I've been working with for the last uh, four or five years. Um, and the idea is really that the, the web, um, the, as the web evolved, we were curious about its potential for learning. And there are really two components of the web that make it an amazing space for learning. One is that there's an, a growing amount of very, very high quality content. So the Open Courseware Consortium, um, the OER movement, Open Educational Resources movement, lots of other people who don't even consider themselves part of that have liberated a huge amount of educational content. You can find you know, high quality background information on almost any topic online, and I mean, you know all this. But it's the combination of that content with millions of other people, and now hundreds of millions of other people that you could potentially work on projects with, that you could ask questions, that you could help learn. And so it's kind of this perfect environment for rethinking the university. And I th kind of the, the thing that really drew me to the web initially when I got excited about it was there's a certain attitude on the web that you, you don't find often in the, in the physical space, and that is this let's just do it attitude. It's like people are, they have a new idea, they just go ahead and they try it. In the physical space, and I know this, I've lived in South Africa for a long time, but I grew up in Germany, so I know in Germany if you have a new idea um, uh, you, and you tell all the other people, there are a million reasons why you shouldn't do it. Everyone tells you exactly it's never going to work, it's going to be too expensive, you'll never make money, and you're going to get fired, and whatever. Like there's a million reasons why it's not going to work. And on the web, it's kind of the opposite. Like first of all, Innovation is cheap, right? It's a, a few bits, a, a few computers. But people are just kind of excited about new ideas. They say, let's just do it. And, you know, if it doesn't work, then we'll try something else. So those two things really kind of, for me, drew me onto the web. Peer-to-peer -peer university is a result of this. And so the Media Lab, Peer-to-peer -peer university are kind of my two pillars. And um, we, uh, I'll, I'll talk about one project that we worked on that maybe gives a, makes this all a little more concrete. And it's really a, a big experiment. It's a course that we ran in the spring of this year called Learning Creative Learning. It's a course that's offered at the Media Lab to students there. Um, we had about somewhere between 13 and 17 students who were enrolled at MIT. They came to classes to the Media Lab every week. They, they um, uh, did this as, as part of their degree programs. Um, and we had 25,000 people who signed up online. So we had a much larger uh, community of people online. And we told everyone from the beginning, we said, this is a big experiment. 
If you expect kind of a perfectly polished course where you sit at home and you consume this knowledge, this is not gonna be for you. This is the place where if you wanna come build this with us and we're gonna make some changes every week based on what works and what doesn't, then please join us. It would be great uh, if we could work together. And, and so lots of people were excited by that. The course talks about, it's kind of meta, uh, it talks about creative learning, which is the, some of the technologies developed at the Media Lab, some of the ways that you can think about learning. And um, kind of it, it was mostly, I think, targeted at educators. What was great is we also had lots of parents sign up, lots of children, librarians, a bunch of other people. So the first design decision that we made was usually when you think about a new innovation, everyone starts thinking about, ooh, it's gonna cost a lot of money. Like if you develop new computer software or platforms, it's gonna be expensive. We, my institution doesn't have the money to do it. Well, MIT may have the money to do it, but we decided not to do that. We decided to use the web as the platform. And it turns out that there's an incredible amount of free to use software that just exists for you to run courses or learning communities on. And you don't have to pay anything and they're relatively easy to use so you need to spend a little bit of time figuring this out. And so we wanted to do this as a model where we could say at the end, you know, anyone could do this. It's like you don't need a lot of money, you don't need a lot of expertise in terms of technology. And, and so we very radically used tools that were out there. The only thing we developed was a very simple open source sign up form to let people sign up and put them into mailing lists, um, which is all open source, so if you wanna use that, it's, it's uh, available for, for you to use. And then we used Google Plus tools mainly, Google Plus communities and Google Plus um, Hangouts. <clears throat> we also, a lot of the large online courses make, um, take advantage of the fact that when you have lots of people, you can do very interesting things that you can't do with small groups of people, and that is amazing. Like the fact that you can have um, you know, 10,000 people who you, you throw out a question and you'll get the diversity of answers that you get back very, very quickly is amazing. But there's also something missing there. If we work in small groups, we get to know each other much more deeply. We start feeling empathy for the other person. It's much easier to feel empathy for you know, a group of four people than it is to feel empathy for a group of 15,000 people. So you build relationships with people in a different way. You're more engaged in their learning. They'll help you more. And so we wanted to make sure that there's the big community, but that there's also the small community. And we encourage people to create their own little communities. And over 450 Google Plus communities were created as part of this course, uh, even though we offered one community for everyone that had you know, tens of thousands of people, or uh, just over 10,000 people, 25,000 people signed up, and then that community had 10,000 and something. Um, it was very global. I was um, very happy to see on the map earlier that there was a dot in South Africa because I've lived there for a long time and I, um, I'm thinking about the country a lot these days. Um, and uh, so we also made a map and actually we didn't make the map. Someone who was in the course made the map. So there was a participant from Italy who uh, on the first day he typed in the Google Plus community said we should really have a map with all the participants. And um, so we replied to him and we said, that's a great idea, you should make the map. And so he made the map and then he posted the link and we distributed it and he became kind of the facilitator of the map and people put their pins in and it was great to see kind of the community coming together. But in the same way that we're excited about the global community, we were also very excited about the local community. So people would start sending us photos of their communities where they learn with each other and they would meet once a week face to face. And I think there's so much richness in face to face when you can sit with the other people and you can exchange uh, 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 things as you're looking at each other and as you may be touching something, something on the table or you can hand a book about that is very difficult to replicate online. So um, in terms of the structure of the content, uh, this was not some, I mean, I think it was radical in some ways, but it, it wasn't radical in other ways. It was, uh, we, we, we made sure that each week had one theme. Uh, so in the creative learning um, spectrum, we picked one theme every week, um, and then we designed an activity that would let people experience the theme. And so every week you got to do something. You didn't, you, there were some readings and people really enjoyed the readings. So you would read some of the leading thinkers who had written about this theme or thought about this theme, but then there was always something that you would have to do and that was very important to us, and I think that's what people uh, enjoyed so much, where they would get to do things and then share them with each other. And so we had lots of uh, really awesome um, activities. If I had more time, I would tell you more about the Marshmallow Challenge, but I encourage all of you to, um, 
Look it up online. The marshmallow challenge is a lot written about it. We didn't invent it. It's fantastic. Um, so then every week we did a live seminar <clears throat> where we invited some people who were you know, experts in a, in a particular aspect and we had a conversation with them for about 45 minutes. And um, in, in this case, it was, uh, this is actually the director of the Media Lab, Joey Ito on the left, and then Mitch Resnick in the middle. He's the professor <clears throat> and the head of the lifelong kindergarten group at the Media Lab, who, I, who is my closest collaborator. And then uh, Mimi Ito, who is Joey's sister, and Mimi is an academic at University of California, and we were talking about interest-based learning in this session. And it's interesting because uh, they were talking to each other jo because they're so different. Mimi has two PhDs from Stanford and, and an undergrad degree from Harvard. Joey didn't have a university degree at all. And so they were talking about like, how did they become who they, who they are and, and kind of talked about their pathways. But anyway, it was a conversation, much more than a lecture. And people really liked seeing those, those conversations. Um, and then we also give, gave people an opportunity to, as you were watching, so we offered the panels, the seminars live. You could watch them live, or you could watch them at any time afterwards if you wanted. And what surprised us is a lot of people watched them live. They wanted to be there with other people. And so we created a back channel tool where they could talk to each other while they were watching. And people often felt like the back channel was more useful than the presentation, especially after Mimi and Joey, which is great because people posted these questions about like the presentation was great, but the back channel was even more interesting. And so then we, we shared it with, with um, Joey and Mimi and they thought it was fantastic that people made, made use of kind of each other as, as learning resources much more than listening to some person on YouTube. Um, we invited people to submit introduction videos. We really wanted to foster kind of the development of friendships and uh, friendships in a, in a you know, comprehensive way. When you get to know other people from other parts of the world, you learn about their lives. I don't know, like your own world changes, and so we wanted to facilitate a lot of that exchange. We asked people to submit videos, and they submitted the most amazing videos. And actually, no, I thought maybe the map person was on this slide, but he's, I think he's maybe the row below. Um, but you, you should check it out. They're still online. Some of them, the guy at the top, he's dancing. Uh, he made a music video. And then they, they started contributing all these resources themselves, uh, which was great to see. So one person would participate in the seminars, and then she would always draw an illustration of what she thought kind of made sense to her in the seminar, and then share it with everyone else. And so then everyone else started commenting on her drawings and what, what did she forget or what, you know, how was it different for them? And, and it was that conversation that was much more important for us than making sure that people watch the videos. It's the kind of reflection and you know, making it applicable um, to your own life. And maybe, so what does it all mean is kind of my, you know, I feel like there's a lot of uncertainty at the moment. And a lot of people are very excited about the possibilities of technology and, and how everything is going to be better. And a lot of people are really worried about it. It's going to destroy the university and, <clears throat> and all those kind of things. But <clears throat> I think one, one thing that is, 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 is clear to everyone is that there is going to be change. Uh, the university has not changed very much in its fundamental structures for a long time. and. Um, you know, maybe it's because the people who developed the first models for it were extremely smart, and those models worked really, really well. But more likely than, than that explanation is that there's a certain sense of inertia that has crept in, and maybe we are not even questioning some of the practices that we are used to. Um, and so maybe the, the, the kind of the push that we're getting now from technology is a, good, is a good opportunity for us to reflect on what is it about the university, the institution, the learning that happens there that we care about? What parts of it do we want to retain and what parts can we, can we do better? And so um, I thought I'd, I'd make a few kind of more, more general statements about where I think this field is going and then let everyone reflect on this you know, in their own context and, and hopefully we can have a conversation about this. There's a, after the MOOC session, there's a half hour for question and answer and uh, I'm gonna go to that session and if, I'm sure the people who are presenting there will talk about some, of, some, of, some similar things and so hopefully there we can have a conversation there. But um, so what does it all mean? What's going to happen? So I think one thing that is very clear is that the innovation that is going to come is going to be disruptive, which means it's not going to be an incremental improvement of what we are familiar with. And that's why I think the MOOCs, even though this session in a way is about MOOCs and I talk very little about MOOCs, is 
this is why I think the MOOCs are not going to be the model that is, is really going to change things up because they are incremental. They, they take a model that we are very familiar with and they make it available to more people and that is amazing. But it's not a disruptive innovation and I think the innovation that is going to come that's really going to change things is going to be disruptive. And what that means is that it will look like something that's very unfamiliar to us and it will look like something that is probably not as good as what we have right now. And we will not pay attention to it because we can say, well, of course, at the university, we do things better. This is not as good as the university. And over time, that thing that was not as good as the university will innovate much, much faster, and it'll come to replace parts of the university that we, are, we held on to while this, this other group that wasn't so held back by our history was innovating much, much faster. And this isn't my idea, but this is a, a, a professor at Harvard Business School who's developed this idea of in disruptive innovation. And if you haven't looked at it, they've written two books on education now, one on schools, one on universities. Um, highly uh, encourage you to engage with some of those ideas because I think they, they have a good sense of how the innovation is going to happen. The second book is, uh, is Black Swan, and the, the, it kind of makes the same point in a very different way. It, it, like the big things that are going to jolt whole systems will look like black swans. Where we have never seen a black swan, we assume there is no such thing. But we only have to see one to realize actually it does exist and then everything kind of falls down because we, we had held on to this idea that it doesn't exist. And um, Nassim Taleb is a kind of e economist, I guess, f f uh, finance person, uh, mathematician who's been writing about kind of disruptive mo uh, experiences around the idea of black swans. And I, I think the, the disruptive innovation in higher education or lifelong learning is going to look like a black swan. It's something that we didn't think existed. And it will come and it will surprise us, hopefully in a good way. A and it will change the way that the university works. And I think there are two um, driving forces for this. And those two driving forces are things we're very familiar with, but we don't often think of them in the context of higher education. Um, so one is the web. I've talked a little bit about the web before. This is a, the Wikipedia logo. Um, and it's this idea that people, it's not just that there's, there are these you know, millions of connections, but it's that people actually self-organized to work on things they cared about and they created um, wonderful uh, products in the, in the process. And there was no master uh, hierarchical organization in the beginning. A lot of this evolved. A lot of the structures ended up being very hierarchical. Like Wikipedia, still uh, Jimmy Wales is still the, um, you know, the benevolent dictator who can theoretically make any decision he wants. But in practice, the, the project and many of these projects are really driven by the community of volunteers who are putting in their free time and who are creating things of amazing beauty and quality. And so if we can understand how those processes where you can bring together thousands of people online to work on things together in their free time, sometimes some of them paid, um, they're, 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 it creates some opportunities in, in learning that I think we haven't leveraged yet. And the other one is that business models will change. There is no way that the current business models will um, survive in, uh, in a time when the, the cost of content goes to zero. So there's a book by Chris Anderson called Free, uh, which essentially argues that when content, the fact that we can digitize content and we can distribute it at almost no cost, pushes the cost that we can charge people for this content down to zero. And there will be exceptions and some people will build interesting business models, but the, the idea that some of the things that we used to charge for to pay for our businesses are just going to go away, I think are much more widely applicable, not just on content. Obviously the university is not content, but I think there's an argument here to be made that lots of the experiences that we consider part of what the university sells, you know, either to the government, to the, to the market, or to the uh, individual student, um, is actually going away because it's go being replaced by things that are available free of cost. So we have to think about what is the business model of the future, or business model maybe is, uh, is a controversial term. Um, and the, the, the other thing is that consumers will build the solutions that they want. Um, and I think that's what the web has shown us, that people will come up with new services and products that they have a, uh, have a desire for. And because it's so easy to innovate now, 
you know, those people could be three guys in a dorm room in, like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, 19 years old in, in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Like, he, you know, he built the third largest, what, what is in terms of numbers, the third largest country in the world now. And so it is entirely conceivable that there, someone will build a university that will be, you know, the largest or the best university. And there'll be two 17-year-old guys who never went to university. And the amazing thing about this, though, I don't think that's a, I mean, maybe that's a little bit scary, but I think the, 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 the bigger opportunity is that these people need help. They need help from people who have thought about this stuff. They need people like you, who are all in this space much more, to guide them to c communicate the values that underlie the, the learning and education that we care about. Um, and I think the, the opportunity is where you and this new wave of innovation come together. And um, the last thing I want to say, is um, when, um, when Henry Ford, uh, he, I don't know wh where he said this, but he was talking about the, the, um, the Model T, the first car, the first um, assembly line uh, produced car. He said if he had listened to his customers at the time, uh, they would have asked for faster horses. Right? And he would have never built the car. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. It's important to listen to the users and, and understand how they're using the university or how they're participating in the university. It's important to listen to the employers to understand what are the kinds of graduates that, that they're looking for. It's important to listen to the governments and understand how the countries evolve. But also it's important to not listen to any of them and think about what could the future of learning and education look like because otherwise we are just gonna make faster horses uh, and slightly better universities when we could also be imagining, you know, a, a completely new way of learning and, and higher education in, for the future. Um, so that's the end of my presentation. Those are my Twitter handles. If you want to stay in touch or come, please come talk to me. I hope we have a, an opportunity to talk during the next couple of days. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your time.